Well, uh, good, good morning and good evening. Uh, let's see who we have in the Zendo. We have Alex and Ravanui and myself, Netty, and on Zoom we have Jack in Brisbane, Sarah in California, Pam in in Canberra, uh, Francis in Canberra, Mark in Pennsylvania, Scott in Monterey, California, and Kai in Santa Fe, Colorado. I think that's Colorado. <laughs> New Mexico. New Mexico. New Mexico. Uh, so, as probably all of us know, the great venerable Thich Nhat Hanh passed away on the 22nd of January. And today is his cremation day. Uh, there are thousands of monks and nuns and students of his in Vietnam right now. And although we say he passed away and that today he is being cremated, he of course spoke of it as a continuation. That, uh, that he continues and that we continue. So I wanted to speak about his teachings on no birth and no death. And to speak about them is not just because it may be an interesting thing to think about, to examine whether there is such a thing as no birth and no death, but because examining closely our understanding of birth and death and our understanding of no birth and no death, because a close understanding of that and an examination of that uh, allows us to become much more intimate with everything in the world. And when we feel more intimate with everything in the world, and we, we can feel it in our bodies, then we care, care for the world and we care for ourselves. So always with all the Buddhist teachings, even when they seem abstract, their, their purpose always is to cultivate compassion. So generally speaking, the common view is that we didn't exist and then we were born and then we have a lifespan where we exist then we die and then we don't exist. Just as a general view, we weren't around during the time of the dinosaurs. We weren't around during the Roman Empire. We started to be around when we were born. That, that is the common view. We didn't exist and we began to exist. And you know, there's that little fuzzy bit about when do we start existing but let's just say at birth we begin to exist then we have a life and if someone has a short life we feel very sad that that lifespan was so short and that's that's fine but we feel more sad <laughs> if we have a strong sense that they didn't exist and they only existed for a tiny bit of time and then they didn't exist again so we have a sense that we have a life and then we die and we no longer are here. We no long, longer exist. Of course, within that, there is a sense for some people that there's a soul that goes to heaven and exists in heaven or some kind of variation of a belief system like that. But as a general, general sense, we don't feel that, we, that the person who has died is here anymore. They're no longer here. They weren't here before in the, during the Roman Empire. Then they were here in the 20th and 21st century, and then they're not here, and they won't be here in the 24th century. And so Thich Nhat Hanh, who people often refer to as Thai, Thai often asked us to you know, look at this deeply look deeply, he would often say, look deeply. And he gave the example of a cloud. 
you know, and it, it's interesting that there are some places where we have this understanding quite well. We kind of do understand about water. Generally speaking, most people have a sense that water just exists and it just transforms. We have a pretty good understanding of how water transforms and doesn't ever go away, it just changes. So Ty uses the example of a cloud. So we see a cloud in the sky and we sort of know that that cloud got there from evaporation from the earth or from the oceans or from lakes and rivers. The water evaporated out and at a certain point it starts to look like a cloud and then we have a convention that we say that's a cloud. Maybe when it's just a teeny little wisp, we just say something else like mist, maybe we call that mist. There's a certain point in which we say it's a cloud but we do know that it, it's just gradually forming into this thing that we call a cloud. And then when the moisture in the cloud is heavy enough, gravity exerts its law and water falls out and it's rain. Or if there's very cold air passing through, the water turns into hail and falls as hail. And the cloud then shrinks. That's one thing that happens. Sometimes there's a cloud and the sun is strong and it just sort of dissipates into vapor that's no longer visible and then we don't see a cloud anymore. And we say there's no clouds in the sky. There's no clouds, we'll say. Or look at the clouds. But at, but at no point did the water that makes up the cloud ever not exist. There wasn't non-existent water that suddenly got born and became cloud and that, that died and then didn't exist anymore. We, I think we all kind of get that with water. Water is a wonderful thing to reflect on. We really do understand the water cycle. The water just keeps on moving. It can boil and bubble and become steam, like in a pot, so there's none left in the bottom of the pot. But we all do know that it kind of turned into vapor. So Ty's teachings is that everything is like this. Water is not a particular thing that just breaks some rule. Everything is like this. It's just maybe not so easy to see as it is with water. And I was thinking about how the reason we can see it with water is the time frame is more, it's very short. It's, it fits in with our human time frame. Like in a, in a course of a day, we can watch water shift from one thing to another. We can see the rain, we can see the clouds, and they get dark and we see the rain fall onto the road and then the sun comes up and the puddle on the road evaporates back up. We can see all of that happen you know, within two or three hours. We can see that cycle, which is why we probably can understand it with water. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's time scale is similar to ours. But with something like carbon, for example, what trees are made out of, what so many things that we use are made of, the time scale can be very, very slow. It's very slow. And I was thinking about all the fossil fuels in, in the ground were formed millions of years ago, all that carbon millions of years ago. And we pulled it up and we've taken the energy that was uh, housed down there in the ground, we've burnt that energy and put that carbon up into the atmosphere. And that energy has resulted in a warming effect on the earth. That's a little harder for us to see. The time frames are different. It's not so visual. It's much harder to comprehend. We have to really reflect at great length to understand the carbon cycle. But we can see it with water. 
and if we can trust that the laws of nature apply then the cycle with water is the same as the cycle with carbon and Kai give, Tai gives another example with fl a flame I was just thinking of that as, as Alex was lighting the candles too it really looks as though there's no flame then we strike a match and there's a flame and we blow out blow it out and there's no flame that's how it looks no flame exists then there's a flame that exists and then we blow it out and there's no flame but that's just the appearance the way Ty describes it is at that moment of striking the match, what has happened is all the conditions have come together for the flame to become visible to us. We, we can see the flame at that moment of striking the match. In that moment, all the places which the flame was existing in the oxygen, in the wood, in the phosphorus and the sulfur and the powdered glass, you know, on, on a match, there's powdered glass in the tip, there's powdered glass on the side of the matchbox. It's the powdered glass creating friction. All of those, the, the fire is there in all of those elements, but not yet visible as fire. The flame's just not yet visible, but it's there in all of the elements. It didn't go from not existing to somehow just miraculously existing out of nowhere and then just strangely enough disappearing into nowhere that's not what happened all that the, the flame was there like and the more deeply we reflect on this the more beautiful everything becomes because we can look at say fabric which we know can burn and we can we can look at it and go hello flame there's a flame in there i can't see it right now but there's a flame hidden there in this fabric. We can do that with everything. We can look at everything and in it see everything else. And it's often easier to see the more obvious things, like the fact that we know fabric can burn. So we can think, wow, I can't quite see flame, but I trust flame is there in this fabric. Hello, flame. In the Zendo here, we don't light the incense. Traditionally, you always light incense, but uh, a lot of people find the smoke from incense a little irritating. So a lot of Zendos around the world now don't light incense. But when Alex is there holding the incense and I come up and bow and take the incense from him and place it in the incenser, the flame is there in the incense. So we can still do it with great reverence as if the flame, because the flame is in that incense. We put it in the incense up and then we bow. The flame is there. And I was listening to Ty the other day and he, he was speaking about this, no birth, no death. There's just continuation. And he said, Nirvana is not seeing dualities. So birth and death is a duality. Nirvana is not seeing dualities. And the ones that he gave the example of was birth and death existing and not existing, being and non-being, same and difference. And it would be, it would kind of take too long to give a, to talk about each of those in any detail right here. But when we look very closely and see each thing in each other thing, then the idea of sameness and difference dissolves. We can superficially have same and difference, us 
and like self and other superficially we can functionally we can because it's maybe necessary on a functional level but looking deeply there's no same indifference the same indifference is an appearance it's not it's not a true reality and just on that little point <laughs> he does give the example of when you have a flame on a candle and then you light that flame to another candle you can ask yourself is that the same flame or a different flame and we can't really answer that question it's not quite the same flame but it's not quite a different flame so nirvana is not seeing dualities another way to say that is that nirvana is right here in samsara so liberation peace and freedom is right here in the troubles of the world in the material world in the appearances of the world and samsara is right here in nirvana the troubles in the world are going to visit us whether we want them to or not and if we can relax with that then here in the samsaric world we can be in nirvana nirvana and samsara are not two things they appear as two things because of our mental cognitions and our habit of dividing things up into black and white us and them earth and death We can do the same reflection just uh, if we think about ourselves personally and ask the question, when did I come into existence? Did I come into existence at the moment of my birth? Did I come into existence at the moment of conception? Did I come into existence when each of my parents were born and the genetics of each of them became the potential for me? Was that the beginning? Or was it when a species called Homo sapiens kind of arrived and then we, then is that, is that where I began? Or when the earth cooled enough to begin to have elements that allowed life to begin? Did I begin then? So you, you can see the same, we can do the same as we do with water and see that really it's just a continuation and a transformation. I'd like to read uh, a section from a book of Thais. Thais wrote so many books. This one is called The Diamond That Cuts Through Illusion. It's on the Diamond Sutra. And uh, this is a, a quote from the Diamond Sutra that Thich Nhat Hanh then speaks about. And it goes for a couple of pages, but it's speaking to the things that we've just talking about. So this is the Buddha speaking to Subhuti and he says, if Subhuti, a Bodhisattva holds on to the idea that a self, a person, a living being or a lifespan exists, that person is not an authentic Bodhisattva. So that's the passage from the Diamond Sutra and this is what Thich Nhat Hanh says. A person has to get rid of the four notions of self, a person, a living being, and a lifespan in order to have the wisdom of non-discrimination. Self refers to a permanent, changeless identity. But since according to Buddhism, nothing is permanent, and what we normally call a self is made entirely of non-self elements, and this concept, a self is made of entirely non-self elements, we spoke about a few weeks ago. I can't remember the title of the talk, but there was one of the talks a few weeks ago that was specifically on this point that we are made of non-self elements. There is really no such entity as a self. Our concept of self arises when we have concepts about things that are not self. So it's that sense of other and self that generates a sense of self. We can examine self and question, is there such a thing as me? We can also do the same with what appears to be others. 
a person I am angry at? Who actually are they? Who is it that I am angry at? We can really examine closely and, and have great difficulty locating them. Cutting realities into pieces we call one part I and the rest not I. The concept of person, like the concept of self, is made up of non-person elements, sun, clouds, wheat, space, and so on. Thanks to these elements, there is something we call a person. But erecting a, a barrier between the idea of person and the idea of non-person is erroneous. If we say, for example, that the cosmos has given birth to humankind and that other animals, plants, the moon, the stars, and so forth, exist to serve us, we are caught up in the idea of person. These kinds of concepts are used to separate self from non-self and person from non-person. We put a lot of energy into advancing technology in order to serve our lives better. And we exploit the non-human elements, such as forests, rivers, and oceans, in order to do so. But as we pollute and destroy nature, we pollute and destroy ourselves as well. The results of discriminating between human and non-human are global warming, pollution, and the emergence of many strange diseases. But this is interesting because this book was published in 1997. So here, right back then, Thich Nhat Hanh was talking about global warming and talking about strange diseases that come from mistreating the environment. In order to protect ourselves, we must protect the non-human elements. This fundamental understanding is needed if we want to protect our planet and ourselves. We usually think of lifespan as the length of our life beginning the moment we are born and ending when we die. We believe that when we are alive during that period, we believe that we are alive during that period, not before or after. And while we are alive, we think that everything in us is alive, that everything in us is life, not death. Once again, we are cutting reality into pieces, separating one side, life, from the other side, death. But to think that we begin our life at the moment we are born and to end at the moment we die is an erroneous view called the view of lifespan. According to Prajna Paramita, life and death are one. We are born and we are born and die during every second of our life. During one so-called lifespan, there are millions of births and millions of deaths. Cells in our body cease to be every day brain cells, skin cells, blood cells, and many, many others. Our planet is also a body, and we are each a cell in that body. Must we cry and organize a funeral every time one cell of our body or one cell of the Earth's body dies? Death is necessary for life to be. In the Samyutta Nikaya, the Buddha says, when causes and conditions are sufficient, eyes are present. When causes and conditions are not sufficient, eyes are absent. And this is eyes, as in eyes, ears. The same is true of body and consciousness. We love life and grasp it tightly. We dread death and worry and want to hide from it. Doing this brings us much worry and anxiety and is caused entirely by our view of lifespan. And then he tells this story about himself. I've never heard him speak so intimately about himself. We all enjoy leaving the city and going to the countryside. The trees are so beautiful, the air is so fresh. For me, this is one of the greatest pleasures of life. In the countryside, I like to walk slowly in the woods, look deeply at the trees and flowers, and when I have to pee, I can do so right in the open air. It's funny hearing <laughs> Dick not hard talk about peeing. <laughs> oh, the fresh air is so much more pleasant than any bathroom in the city, especially some very smelly public restrooms. But I have to confess that for years I was uneasy about peeing in the woods. 
The moment I approached a tree, I felt so much respect for its beauty and grandeur that I couldn't bring myself to pee right in front of it. It seemed impolite, even disrespectful. So I would walk somewhere else, but there was always another tree or bush and I felt equally disrespectful there. We usually think of our bathroom at home made of wood, tile or cement as inanimate and we have no problem peeing there. But after I studied the Diamond Sutra, I saw that wood, tile and cement are also marvelous and animate. And I began to feel uncomfortable using my own bathroom. <laughs> then I had a realization. I realized that peeing is also marvelous and wondrous. It's our gift to the universe. We only have to pee mindfully with great respect for ourselves and whatever surroundings we are in. So now I can pee in nature, fully respectful of the trees, the bushes and myself. Through studying the Diamond Sutra, I solved this dilemma and I enjoy being in the countryside now more than ever. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? So I think I'll finish on that note uh, and just open up to questions or comments. So feel, feel free to unmute and ask a question. Just put your hands in Gasho. And hello to a little person there with Francis. Hi. Go ahead, little person. Hello. Hi. I'm Archer. Archer? Yep. Archer. That's a beautiful name. Hi. Did you want to uh, have anything you'd like to share with the rest of us? It's fine. It's okay. okay. What did you have? What did you have for breakfast today? I had I haven't had breakfast. Oh. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, after this talk, you better go off and have some breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> you must. Be very strong that you having a bit of a lazy Sunday. Yes, that's beautiful. Well, thank you for saying hello to us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just want to thank you for this talk. I've been thinking about Thai. Yeah, of course, all week. I generally think about him quite a bit because I started sitting with him back in the late 80s in California. I was lucky enough to be there when he was there a number of times. But right now, what I'm really enjoying are all the animal sounds in the background that are so unusual um, to what we have here in this country. I, I don't, I can't identify most of them. So there's there's that, there's that feeling of nature, which Ty was always talking about and always connected to. And um, it's kind of cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, out here at the moment, I can see sulfur crested cockatoos. Well, I can't see one this very moment, but they were out there in the eucalypts. That's probably one of the birds you're hearing. They have quite a loud kind of call. And a few others, what are the other ones, Kim? Um, we get a lot of different kinds of parrots, um, so like uh, rosellas and rainbow lorikeets and uh, king parrots. We also get um, crested pigeons. Oh, they're the ones with the little thing on their head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're so cute. Um, they make noises when they fly. Um, we get bower birds and a lot of little birds as well. Um, like little tiny ones that jump around. Oh, there's one right there. See, they hop around. They have really little tweety kind of fun. Yeah. yeah, we're very lucky to have a beautiful glass. The whole back wall is glass and just this view out into all the surrounding trees. 
Any, any other question or comment on any aspect of the talk on no birth and no death? Oh, there's people waiting to come in. Yes, well, oh, Scott coming back. So what what you can do with this is just practice uh, in your as you're moving through your day to look at an object and think about its origins and go through that process of of seeing that it that it's just continued from one one form into another form and practice that with anything that's around you. I mean, there's objects, we're surrounded by objects and we're surrounded by um, plants and animals and insects and, and people. We can do that sort of contemplative exploration and then start to notice the effect it has on you. Because the, the effect is, uh, another aspect of feeling more intimate with things is there's less fear. When you feel connected to everything, there's nothing to fear. The habit of fear diminishes. Because even if a person is angry with you, say a driver in a car shouts at you, if you see yourself in them, then it's not so scary. It's not so frightening. And fear is, is the main way in which we kind of go whoop, and feel like a self. Fear is the most powerful way to, from being expansive to oh, defensive is fear. Fear is the thing that does that. So this process of contemplating no birth and no death, the continuation that we are all in a state of continual flux reduces our fear. And that's not just a personal benefit, obviously. If we don't have fear, we're going to be more skillful in the world, more skillful with others. Um, an area I find that kind of contemplation, especially um, intense and obvious, is in uh, like pain and illness. Um, because our, our sort of intuitive response is like pain and illness are bad and health and painlessness are good. Mm -hmm. um, and to when you sit with pain and illness um, from that perspective, then that distinction dissolves. Yes. Uh, and it's it's quite intense and it's quite a, a, a big difference and you notice it a lot. Yes. Yes. Pain's a great example that if if we can try and not be fearful of pain like some pain is just so intense there's no option but to be in excruciating pain that's sometimes how some pain is and we can just be humbled by the fact that there's nothing we can do except go ah, and be in extreme pain but a lot of pain there's room to be fearless about that pain and soften with that pain and then the pain's not so bad it's still there but it's not so bad you can be fearless with it. Even with the excruciating pain, if you allow yourself to relax into it, it's not, it's pain and you might still be screaming, but it's not bad. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually quite a relief, I have found, yeah. in moments of extreme pain, when you just completely give into it. It's just pain and that you're not afraid of it anymore because fear is like fear that it's going to be worse or that you're going to die from it or something. Mm -hmm. And once you stop worrying about what the pain means, then it's not scary anymore. Yeah. It's great practice. All right, well, we'll finish with a closing chant and then do finishing bows and um, you can stay till the bows are complete or you can leave earlier and Pam's, is, did you want to, or are you just, just doing this? <laughs> okay. 
Beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. Buddha's way is unsurpassable. I vow to become it.